Hey Optimancers! In my last video I discussed the challenges in making a build focused on mounted combat, and I'm not talking about just having a mount. Any character can have a mount, and I think pretty much any character can benefit from having a mount, but if we really want to focus on being mounted, there are some challenges. I mean, if we want to make our classic knight in shining armor on a warhorse with a lance that really focuses on that kind of combat, we have the issue of keeping the mount alive as well as getting the most out of that style of combat. Today I'm going to show you one way to do that. A character that has good versatility and is often going to find themselves in the middle of their enemies on their mount and is going to need to keep that mount alive as well as deliver decent damage and be able to contribute in other ways. And I think we're going to call this guy Surrounded. Now we're not going to need Magic the Gathering content or Eberron content. None of those things are going to be needed. I am going to assume that we will be able to access our optional class features. So let's get started on this build, but first I want to talk a little bit about our sponsor. This video has been sponsored by the Mammoth Chronicles, now live on Kickstarter. The Mammoth Chronicles is a unique concept where Mammoth Games have combined a year's worth of 5th edition adventure content. That's 8 detailed adventures spanning levels 4 through 11. And here is the kicker. They've created 131 premium STL minis made for those adventures. So you have that custom monster, but you also have the exact mini that you need for it. And the best part is, whatever your platform is, whether you use physical books or PDFs, virtual tabletop tokens, Roll20, 3D printing, or even paper minis, they have you covered. Check out the link to the Kickstarter in the video description. So the primary challenge of a character that focuses on mounted combat is what happens when we don't have our mount, like whether it dies or it won't fit in the hallway of the room, then suddenly our character concept is out the window. Mount survivability becomes paramount. Hmm, maybe I should have called this character survivability. Oh well. So in the last video I explained how the mounted combatant feat really helps protect the mount. But on its own, it's just not enough. A 19 hit point warhorse just doesn't scale and isn't going to survive those non-attack sources of damage, whether it's area of effects or traps or non-attack damaging spells. So with this build, I'm going to show how we can use the Find Steed spell, which technically gives you just a warhorse. But when we're done, our mount will be much more than just a warhorse. And if we're going to focus on mounted combat, that's exactly what we need to do. The key here is this line of the spell. You can make any spell you cast that targets only you also target your steed. This is the key to making our fine steed mount be able to scale with us. Now, fine steed is only a paladin spell, second level. So the fastest way we can get access to this mount. I mean, obviously, bards can do it through magical secrets, but if we want to get it as fast as possible, that's going to require five levels of Palvin. There's just no way to do it sooner. And so that is how we're going to start our character. We're going to get Fine Steed as soon as possible. Now, there's no reason we can't pick up a regular mount before level five, but I would just be careful about assuming it's going to survive. So for this build, I think we're going to hold off with selections that only work for mounted combat until we're at least level 4. So let's start with our racial selection. And, you know, the classic knight in shining armor, they are going to be human. So I think we're justified in going with variant human here. Variant human, of course, gives us 2 plus 1s with ability score increases and a bonus feat. And the ability score increases we're going to start with, we're going to start with our charisma, and our constitution. And then with our bonus feat, we are going to choose the piercer feat. The piercer feat is really good once we are on our mount, but it's also decent before we're on our mount. And that's why we want to start with it at level one. It's going to increase our strength or dexterity by one, and we will choose our strength score. Also, once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage, you can re-roll one of the attack's damage dice, and you must use the new roll. And when you score a critical hit that deals piercing damage to a creature, you can roll one additional damage die when determining the extra damage type the target takes. Now, normally, 
the first feed I would take on a melee build would be maybe Polar Master. But once we're mounted with a lance, that feat does nothing for us. And there's no way to switch a feat once we take it. But you know, even at levels 2 through 4, we can potentially pick up some kind of mount, in which case we could use a lance. But if we're not mounted, then we'll want a backup weapon. Now, we can use the lance when not mounted, as long as we have both hands. The problem is that disadvantage that the lance gives us if we're within 5 feet. Without a mount, it's pretty hard to back away 5 feet when that enemy closes with you without provoking an opportunity attack. So, we want a backup weapon. Now, we should talk a little bit about realism. I mean, our best backup weapon would be a pike. But how exactly are we carrying a backup pike? It's not fitting in your backpack or in a scabbard. A rapier, though, it's perfectly realistic to wear as a sidearm. If you play light on realism, then go ahead and grab a pike. So here's the math. If we roll our d12 and we roll a 6 or less on damage, we're going to re-roll using this feat. This means our average result of any damage roll of 6 or less is actually 6.5, which is the average result of the re-roll. So to figure out our average damage, it's 6 times 6.5, which is 39. So 39 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12. That adds up to 96, and then we divide by 12, and that gives us our actual average damage with a lance, and that is 8. With our rapier, it's best to re-roll on a 4 or less. So it's 4 times 4.5, which is 18, then add 5, 6, 7, and 8 for a total of 44 divided by 8, which is an average result of 5.5. Now we can only do this once on our turn, which is fine for now, but once we get extra attack, it'll only affect the first result of 6 or lower. In fact, I would probably only re-roll on a 5 or lower if it's my first of two attacks, just in case. Okay, then our second benefit is when we score a critical hit, we get an additional die of damage. Once again, the d12 is our biggest benefit, giving crits an extra 6.5 damage on average. Okay, ability scores are easy, so I'm using a point buy here, and we're going to go ahead and put 15 in strength, constitution, and charisma. And with the plus ones we've gotten from our feet and our race, that'll give us 16 in all three scores. Now, if we weren't going six levels in paladin, we could go lower on charisma, but plus three bonus to all saving throws, it's worth the extra level. And our first level is going to be in Paladin. This means we won't be proficient in Constitution saving throws, but we will be proficient in Wisdom saves. And once we get six levels in Paladin, that's still a plus six Concentration save. So, not bad. There are two main reasons we want to start with Paladin. The first is we want those fifth and sixth level features and spells as soon as possible. The other is that Paladin only gives us proficiency in heavy armor if we take it first. Otherwise, we would be stuck in medium armor, and medium armor and innate dexterity, these are not mixing well. We're going to take athletics and persuasion as our starting skills. By the way, I took perception as my racial selection, and we're going to get divine sense. This is a pretty circumstantial ability. On most days, you probably won't use it at all, but you could use it a number of times equal to one plus your charisma modifier, so we could use it four times a day. We'll never need it four times a day. The feature that's pretty strong right at level one is Lay on Hands. Your Blessed Touch can heal wounds. You have a pool of healing power that replenishes you when you take a long rest. With that pool, you can restore a total number of hit points equal to your Paladin level times five. You do not need to use these all at once. You can heal one hit point five times if that's what you want to do, and at first level, that might be your best bet. Somebody goes down, you not only stabilize them, but you bring them back up using one use of Lay on Hands for one hit point, and you can do that up to five times. Also, we have the ability to cure diseases or neutralize poisons using our Lay on Hands feature. That uses all five points, though Lay on Hands is going to scale amazingly well, gaining additional five hit points of healing with each level we gain in Paladin. I've gone ahead and taken the Noble background, adding the History and Animal Handling proficiencies. As for equipment, grab a shield, grab a rapier. Chainmail is our starting armor, but eventually we want to upgrade to plate armor. Speaking of wishlists, we want a mount and a lance. We're just not going to have that at level 1. 
I can't say when it's first going to become available to you, but pick them up when you can. And at level 5, we can provide our own mount. And let's talk about our damage at level 1. It's fine. It's 5.5 base weapon damage from Piercer, plus 3 from Strength, and 60% chance to hit. That's 5.1, then a 5% chance to crit, in which we add 2d8 because of Piercer. So that's 0.45 more, and that's 5.55 damage. That's pretty much the baseline I would expect from a first level character. So let's look at our decisions to get to level 5, and we're going to go straight Paladin. In fact, I recommend going 6 levels of Paladin, because I think you would be crazy to leave Paladin at level 5. Level 6 is just too good. So we're going to pick a fighting style at level 2, and we're going to take the dueling fighting style. This isn't just going to help our rapier, this is also going to help our lance. In either case, it gives us a plus 2 bonus to damage rolls with the weapon. And by the way, once we're using the lance and we're mounted, we're still going to keep the rapier on our scabbard, just in case we are dismounted. That does give us just that backup weapon we need. We're going to get Divine Smite at level 2. So, 2d8 radiant damage added to a successful melee attack by expending a spell slot. We add a d8 if it's a fiend or undead, and we add a d8 for each additional spell slot level. It's all doubled if we get a critical hit. When should we use this? Well, I just did a video on that, so I'll link it up above. At third level, we can harness divine power to expand a channel divinity to recover a spell slot. Nice thing is, this scales even after we multiclass, so eventually you can recover a third level slot with it. And this character is going to be using Harness Divine Power a lot. We also get Divine Health at level 3. Disease immunity is eh, fine, I guess. Doesn't come up much, and we could cure diseases already, so I mean it's just not a big deal. Then we choose our Sacred Oath. When you are taking 6 levels in Paladin, and then multiclassing out, then keep in mind, there's not much difference between the different oaths. It's some oath spells, and a channel divinity that you can't use more than once per short rest, if you use it at all, since you can also recover spell slot with it. It's not a big deal. The way I am going to go here, I guess partially just to do something different, but also because there is a spell that I really like here, is Oath of the Crown. Now the channel divinities for Oath of the Crown, they're not great. We get Champion Challenge. As a bonus action, you issue a challenge that compels other creatures to do battle with you. Each creature of your choice you can see within 30 feet of you must make a Wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, a creature can't willingly move more than 30 feet away from you. The effect ends on the creature if you're incapacitated or die, or if the creature is more than 30 feet away from you. I would really like this feature, except the 30 foot distance is too much. I, I mean, it should be limited to... 15 feet or 10 feet, then it would be really good. 30 feet, this is a little harder to use because often your backline or your range characters, they might not be more than 30 feet away from you. Uh, so then the Champion's Challenge really isn't doing anything for you. Now, maybe we can get our range characters further than 30 feet away from us. It really depends on what kind of battle map we're looking at. Then Champion Challenge might be okay, and at least it's only a bonus action to use. The other is Turn the Tide. As a bonus action, you can bolster injured creatures with your channel divinity. Each creature of your choice that can hear you within 30 feet of you regains hit points equal to a d6 plus your charisma modifier. For us, that's plus 3, if it has no more than half its hit points. That last phrase is what kind of sours this for me. If we have to limit this to only characters that have half their hit points or less, then it really is not nearly as good. Again, going to be useful some of the time, and at least it's only a bonus action, and it affects multiple creatures. Both these channel divinities, they're not terrible. I would just say, as far as subclass features go for channel divinity, this is not in the top half. So, just expect, we'll often be using our Harness Divine Power for our channel divinity. The reason I'm choosing this subclass, honestly, is the Oath Spells. We're basically only going to get the first and second level spells before we multi-class out, but that's Command, which is a good spell. Compel Duel, which actually is a little redundant with Champion Challenge. Then we get Warding Bond, this is the spell we want, and Zone of Truth, this is a pretty good utility spell. Then at fourth level, we're going to get Ability Score Increase. So we are on the cusp of a Fine Seed spell, so it's time to pick up Mounted Combatant. 
I discussed this in my last video, but basically three benefits, tax against your mount, you can redirect to yourself, your mount basically gets the equivalent of the rogue or monk's evasion feature, and when we attack an unmounted creature that is smaller than our mount, we get advantage on our attack. This is basically the big one. We can't count on this being advantage all the time. I mean, it won't be. But if our enemies are medium sized or smaller, then we're golden. And if we have a mix of enemies, then our preferred targets will be those that are medium sized or smaller. If they're mounted, then we want to dismount them, probably by attacking the mounts first. But if our only possible targets are large size or bigger, then we are just out of luck. At level five, we get extra attack, which obviously is massive. Basically, it's doubling our offensive output. And at level six, we get Aura of Protection. That's plus three to all our saving throws, as well as the saving throws of any ally within 10 feet of us. Think about it this way. Our proficiency bonus at this level is plus three. So at this point in our progression, this is like proficiency in all saving throws we weren't proficient in already, and double proficiency in those we were. I have prepared Bless, Cure Wounds, Heroism, Aid, Find Steed, of course, and Magic Weapon. So let's go through those quickly and explain why I've chosen them. So let's start with the big one. Find Steed, ideally on the average day, you don't need to cast this at all. Once you cast Find Steed, the mount lasts until it dies or you dismiss it. It's intelligent, you have telepathic communication with it, and the big part, well, mount it on your steed. You can make any spell you cast that targets only you also target your steed. This is worded differently than Twin Spell Metamagic. With Twin Spell, the spell needs to be one that targets only one creature and without a range of self. In the case of shared spells, as long as you're the only target of the spell and you're mounted, then the spell is shared. Now, I've talked about this before, but it's not necessarily 100% clear exactly which spells are shared and which ones aren't. Um, there's a lot of gray area, things like the Dragon's Breath spell, does that just target the person you cast it on, or does it target the creatures that are eventually hit with that effect? The designers say it is uh, technically targeting more than one creature, so it's not good for Twin Spell, probably not good for Fine Steed as well. The selections I've made here are based on my understanding of what spells can be shared, but it doesn't hurt to have a conversation with your DM just to know where they're sitting on shared spells. Now Bless. It's just a good buff. Choose three creatures, maybe including yourself, and they get a d4, two attack rolls and saving throws for up to a minute using your concentration. This uses an action, and probably an action in combat, since it's just a minute duration. But for a first level slot, this is a solid buff. Now I normally wouldn't jump on Cure Wounds as a Paladin. This is an exception. Basically, we can double the healing because of the share spell feature. So let's say we get in an area of effect and we take damage and our mount takes damage. Cast Cure Wounds on yourself, then the share spell feature functions and the mount is healed as well. That's 2d8 plus 6 healing from a first level slot and one action. That's solid. Next up is Heroism. And yeah, another share spell candidate. Your mount is not immune to fear and isn't going to have a great wisdom saving throw. Cast Heroism on yourself Share it with your steed, and now you're both immune to fear for the duration. In addition, both you and your mount will get three temporary hit points that replenish at the start of your turns. Next up, Aid. This is going to be a spell we cast a lot later on. I'm going to go over that in detail. This is just one of the best spells for upcasting. But also, with Warding Bond, we're basically doubling the added durability of our mount. Think about it this way. In 19 hit point Warhorse, isn't all that durable. Add aid, now we're up to 24. Then, if we cast a warding bond, that's effectively 48 hit points. But when we start upcasting this, it's going to get really impressive. Of course, if we're using warding bond on our mount, then we definitely want to include ourselves in that aid spell. So we should probably discuss warding bond. This is a one action cast, lasts an hour, no concentration. It targets a willing creature you touch, and creates a mystic connection between you and the target until the spell ends. While the target is within 60 feet of you, that shouldn't be a problem when we're mounted. It gains a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws, and has resistance to all damage. 
Also, each time it takes damage, you take the same amount of damage. So basically, when the mount is hit with damage, you're splitting the damage, you take half, and the mount takes half. Next, let's talk about the magic weapon spell. Now, if we get a magic lance, then replace this spell. Remember, with a paladin, we can just change the spells we've prepared with a long rest. But without a magic lance, this is our insurance policy, should we come up against creatures that are resistant or immune to attacks from non-magical weapons. It's only a bonus action to use, so we're not losing any attacks for casting it. Ultimately, if you can craft your own magic items, or buy magic items, or your DM gives you magic items tailored to your character, you probably don't need this. But... I mean, even if they run published adventures as they're written, I can't think of any magical lances I've come across. Okay, so that takes us to level 6, and let's talk about our damage. We're now mounted, using our lance with extra attack and the dueling combat style. Now, let's assume no advantage. So, that's 13 damage per attack, 2 attacks, so 26 times 55% chance to hit, that gives us 14.3. Then crits, so we have 5% times 13. Let's make that 31, because if we hit with a critical hit, let's use a first level spell slot to smite. So with two attacks, that gives us another 3.1 damage. Now at this level, 16.5 is the baseline I use, and we're at 17.4, that's without advantage. But it's gonna be more than that, because we should have advantage, probably even most of the time, it's hard to estimate exactly how much. But what I can do is show you how much the damage goes up if we have that advantage. So take that 26 damage, but now our chance to hit is 80%, so it becomes 21 damage. Our crit chance goes up to 10%, so now that crit damage is 6.2. So 17.4 damage per round jumps to 27.2. That is 65% over the baseline. That is good damage. So starting at level 7, we're going to multi-class out of Paladin, and we're going to go Sorcerer for the next 8 levels. And that's actually where I'm going to tie up this build. This is going to be huge for us. Now I need to talk a little bit about equipment. Using an emblem on a shield as a spell focus as a Paladin works just fine. But if we are using a shield and a lance, then we're going to have difficulty with somatic components of a Sorcerer. Check with your DM how they handle somatic components. But if you're not going to be able to cast your sorcerer spells with a lance and a shield, the fix is actually really easy. Just unequip your shield. And then you will be able to use all your sorcerer spells and all your paladin spells, no problem. Cost you two armor class, that's not the end of the world. Now, I said with paladin, if you want to choose another subclass, go ahead, it's not a big deal. However, with sorcerer, there's really only one subclass that's going to work. And that is... Clockwork Soul. Clockwork Magic and Fine Steed's Share Spells feature, that's, oh, a chef's kiss right there. So with four levels of Sorcerer, our extra spells from Clockwork Magic would be Alarm, Protection from Evil and Good, Aid, Lesser Restoration, Dispel Magic, Protection from Energy, Freedom of Movement, and Summon Construct. We're going to be trading out all of these except for the fourth level spells. Every time we gain a sorcerer level after taking this subclass, we can replace one of these spells with another spell of the same level. That spell can be any abjuration or transmutation spell from the sorcerer, warlock, or wizard spell list. Oh yes. So after eight levels, this is going to be our clockwork magic list. Now to see how this all works together, we're going to come back to this after we select our sorcerer spells, but we're going to have absorb elements, armor of Agathis, ooh. Enlarge, Reduce, yes, Dark Vision, Fly, oh, Haste, Polymorph, and Freedom of Movement. With Fine Steed, this is just a beautiful list. Going back to the rest of our features, at first level we get a reaction to remove advantage or disadvantage to a roll made by a creature within 60 feet of us. It's not bad. I usually see this to cancel out magic resistance, but it's a decent reaction. Usable, a proficiency bonus, number of times per long rest. Then we get sorcery points, and we're going to select quicken spell and subtle spell as our metamagic options. The one we're going to use most is quicken spell. This allows us to cast a spell with a casting time of one action as a bonus action. It costs us two sorcery points. 
Subtle Spell allows us to remove any verbal and somatic components from a spell for one sorcery point. Quicken Spell is going to be really big on the first round of combat. It is going to allow us to set up that spell we need with our Find Steed spell to make sure that we get where we need to be or have the advantage we need. Once again, I'll talk about this more once we have our spells fully selected. At fourth level in Sorcerer, we get an ability score improvement. And yeah, don't adjust your screen. Yeah, I'm taking Heavy Armor Master. This bumps our strength up to 18 and reduces any bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage from non-magical attacks by 3. So why do we want this? Well, first, we have a strength of 17. This bumps it up to 18. That's great. But also the feature here is pretty good because we're redirecting attacks from our mount to us. We're going to be taking more damage, and this is going to reduce that damage. At level 5, we get Magical Guidance. This allows us to spend a sorcery point to reroll a failed ability check. Mainly, I see this used for Counterspell or Dispel Magic, but with this character, we'd use it for both of those, but we would also use it for Grapple Checks, because, you know what? We're not a bad grappler. We have good strength. We are proficient in Athletics. Alright, so Bastion of Law. This comes at level 6 and allows us to create a barrier with our Sorcery Points that decreases the damage we take by a number of D8s equal to the Sorcery Points spent. You can choose how many to expend with each hit, and this would be fantastic, but realistically, I don't know how many extra sorcery points we're going to have. I guess what I will say is this. I'm going to assume for the rest of this build that we're probably not going to use Bastion of Law, but if I was in a case where I expected only maybe one or two combats in a day, then I think it might be worth four, maybe even eventually six sorcery points on Bastion of Law, and that would combine amazingly with what we're already going to be having on this character. And then at level 8, we're going to get ability score improvement, and I would increase my charisma to 18 here. Now, if you wanted to, you could increase your strength to 20, and I don't think that's a bad way to go. But just remember, charisma, this is adding to all our saving throws. That's a pretty big deal. Now let's talk about our spell selection. Okay, so spell selection. First, let's talk about cantrips. I mean, pick what you like. I pick Control Flames, Firebolt, Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, and Prestidigitation. I don't expect to use them a lot, maybe for some utility or occasionally for a ranged attack, uh, but these basically pick what you like. What I wouldn't worry about is picking up Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. These do not work with extra attack, and they are probably not worth the two sorcery points to quicken them, and they don't work well with Reach Weapons anyways. So let's look at our leveled spell selection. I have picked up Featherfall, Shield, Mirror Image, Misty Step, Web, Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fire Shield, and Greater Invisibility. Now I said in the video leading up to this one, and in this video, how enemies are going to try to kill our mount, and how losing the mount is devastating to us, how size can be a problem for getting advantage. So let's just show what we can do here. So this is our spell slots. We have four first level slots, three second level slots, three third level slots, three fourth level slots, and two fifth level slots, and one sixth level slot. This is level 14. How would we use those? Remember, we don't have any spells of fifth or sixth level. That gives us three spell slots that are a higher level than any of our spells, or as I would refer to them, our aid and armor of Agathis slots. So we're going to start out with a 6th level slot. We'll use that right away. That's an aid spell, and it's going to be 25 additional maximum hit points to us and our mount for 8 hours. We're also going to target some other lucky party member, and they will also get those 25 hit points. We will follow that up with a 5th level spell slot on Armor of Agathis. That's 25 temporary hit points for ourselves, and since it targets only us, it is shared with our mount. And whenever we take damage from a melee attack, or our mount takes damage from a melee attack, the attacker takes 25 points of cold damage. This continues until the temporary hit points are completely gone. Now that Bastion of Law feature, if we can afford the sorcery points to use it, this is going to increase the damage that we cause with Armor of Agathis. But another thing that's going to increase the damage we cause is the fact we shared it with our mount. Normally, an enemy would have to do 25 hit points of damage to get rid of the Armor of Agathis feature 
from this character. But because we've shared it with our mount, and because we can redirect attacks from our mount, then we can potentially have 50 hit points they have to do before getting rid of it. We should expect this to do significant damage to enemies. And with a one hour duration, we can do this outside of combat and we can replenish it because we have that second fifth level slot. And frankly, if we needed to replenish it again, I'd be totally willing to use a fourth or third level slot to replenish it again. But we're about to prepare for combat, so let's do a fourth level slot as well. And we'll cast Fire Shield. We'll cast this on ourselves and we'll share it with our mount. Now, both of us either get cold or fire resistance and whenever a creature within 5 feet of us hits us with an attack, they're going to take 2d8 fire or cold damage. And then we'll expand a second level slot, Dark Vision, and that is shared with our mount as well. Finally, one more second level spell slot for Warding Bond on our mount. So how does this all fit together? Well, let's say now we're going to enter combat. Now we want to quicken a spell on round 1. Is the opponent large? Then we're going to cast a Quickened Enlarge Reduce, now we're large and our mount is huge. We get a damage boost and we're going to get advantage on our attacks. Is our opponent flying? Then a quick and fly. Cast on ourselves and it's shared with our mount. So if we get dismounted, we're still fine. Are they huge or gargantuan? Then we'll quicken an improved invisibility. Share with our mount and we're harder to hit and we have advantage on our attacks. Are they super far away? Well then we'll quicken a haste spell. We get an extra attack and a plus two armor class and it's shared with our mount. The mount has a base speed of 60 so that becomes 120 with a dash that's 240 and with a hasted action dash that's 360 feet of movement in one turn. Then we can take our action and our hasted action. Now let's say we don't need any of those. Okay so we'll quicken a web or a summoned construct. There is a spell to quicken on round one regardless of our situation. Now, how durable is our 19 hit point warhorse now? Well, any attack that targets them, we can have target us instead. The mount started with 19 hit points. We add 25 from aid, 25 from armor of Agathus, so that brings us to 69 hit points. Then the warding bond gives them resistance to all damage. So that's 138 effective hit points at level 14. That is going to be more than the other members of our party. We can switch it to us. They probably miss because we have full plate and the shield spell. But if they hit, they take 25 damage from Armor of Agathis and 9 more from Fire Shield, and we're in good shape. And so is our mount. But what about when Armor of Agathis runs out? Well, then maybe we don't switch it to us. They hit the mount. They take 34 damage. The mount takes half damage. And that Armor of Agathis is probably still there to damage them for another 34 damage on their next attack. They need to do 50 points of damage in a single attack to drop that armor of Agathis. So this character should have advantage most of the time. We can get it pretty much wherever we need to, whether it's through Enlarge Reduce or Quickened Greater Invisibility. But you know what? Let's say we are in a case where we're squeezed into a small room or something. Then we could Quicken and Enlarge Reduce and reduce our size. But let's talk about our damage. Well, we have 8 base from the Lance, plus 2 from Dueling, plus 4 from Strength, 80% chance to hit with advantage, that's 22.4. Then Crits, 13 base, plus 48 from a first level Smite, has 31 or 6.2 more. So we're at 28.6. But then we gotta consider our Armor of Agathis and our Fire Shields. Let's say we're setting it off once in a combat. I mean, I think that's a conservative estimate. I would expect more than that. But even with once, that's 8.5 DPR more. Now, not counting possible haste or enlarge or reduce added damage, we're already at 37.1. Baseline is 26.55 at this level. We're solidly 40% over the baseline before adding any of those other things. So that begs the question, what happens now? We're level 14. What happens if we continue leveling up? Well, you can continue with Sorcerer. I think this is a good choice because it adds higher level spell slots for more Armor of Agathis temporary hit points and damage, and more aid hit points. You could go back to Paladin if that's what you wanted to do, or you could mix in a bit of crit fishing if you wanted, add three levels of champion, that would do that. Whatever you do, I think we've shown that with Fine Steed, you can have a mount that isn't in a lot of danger, 
that you can fly if you need, move ultra fast if you need, even damage the enemies just by being hit. So I hope you enjoyed my Fine Steed Focus build. In my next video, we'll take a look at how to make the most of Fine Greater Steed. I hope you'll join me for that. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.